Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is March 31, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 73. For the past several days two news stories have been competing for top billing here in the United States. One is the conflict in El Salvador surrounding national elections which were held on Sunday three days ago. The other is the third Space Shuttle mission which ended yesterday. On the face of it, these two headline events would seem to have little in common. The brutal civil war in the jungles of Central America seems part of a different world from that of America's newest spaceship, but the fact is that these two news stories are related to one another. El Salvador and the Space Shuttle are both involved in the complex program leading up to Nuclear War One. El Salvador is just one hot spot in the growing cauldron of deliberate world crises to bring on war, and the Space Shuttle is being used for secret military preparations for war itself. In AUDIO LETTER No. 72 last month I reported that the war timetable of America's Bolshevik planners is being speeded up. If their plans succeed, the time left before the outbreak of all-out nuclear war is measured in months, and so far, my friends, their plans are succeeding. All around the world the flames of crisis are continuing to spread. In Central America the initial crisis in El Salvador has now expanded to include Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala. On the day after Space Shuttle 3 took off this month, a military coup took place in Guatemala, and we haven't seen anything yet. Soon we will be hearing of new threats to our lifeline through the Panama Canal, and the Carter Administration's giveaway of the canal does not become final for nearly 20 more years. As of now, the canal remains a potential new Pearl Harbor for us. Overseas other crises are also continuing to simmer and spread. In Iran the plans for a new explosion of turmoil are right on track. New developments in the Iran-Iraq War are paving the way for this. Another factor, as I have previously reported, is to be the revelation that Ayatollah Khomeini is dead. Early this month there were harbingers of things to come in the news, especially overseas. For example, on March 6 the BBC quoted a London Times article questioning whether Khomeini is still alive. The article expressed suspicions that fake pictures are now being used showing a double for Khomeini. Another simmering crisis is the contrived flap between the United States and Libya. For the moment it's on the back burner, but the Libya crisis is one of the time bombs which the Bolsheviks here can use to help set off a big war to come. In that regard there were two major developments this month which went almost unnoticed in the news, and they are synchronized perfectly with the overall war timetable that I made public last month. First on March 3 Libya's Colonel Gaddafi drew a line in the dust against the United States. In Tripoli, the Libyan capital, Gaddafi delivered a fiery speech to listeners gathered for a rally. He reminded them of the Nimitz episode last August when two Libyan jets were shot down, and he said, quote, If America enters the Gulf of Sidra, war in the full sense of the word will begin between us and them, war with planes, navies, missiles, everything." Unquote. Within two weeks the United States promised in effect that it will soon walk across Gaddafi's line in the dust. On March 16 Navy Secretary John Lehman declared that the United States will conduct naval exercises again within the Gulf of Sidra, and we will do so within the next six months. Lehman's statement was a virtual promise of war to come. It was reported that day by the BBC but went unnoticed here in America. Crises within the Soviet bloc are also continuing. The war in Afghanistan continues to drag on thanks to ongoing heavy involvement by the CIA. Poland too is an explosion waiting to happen. Martial law has removed the spark for that explosion by jailing the leaders of Solidarity, 
Solidarity was the main tool of the American Bolsheviks in trying to set off a revolt in Poland, but soon the Bolshevik war planners here expect to provide a new spark for revolt in Poland. Last fall the Bolsheviks here re-established the covert influence within the Vatican which they held briefly three years ago. Now the Bolsheviks here are trying to revive their old plan called the Pope's Revolution to occur in Poland. I gave the details of the original plan in AUDIO LETTER No. 42. It was built around a planned Papal visit to Poland on a highly emotional occasion, the 900th anniversary of the martyrdom of St. Stanislaus. The original Pope's Revolution plan was foiled by changing the date of the Pope's visit, but now a new Papal visit to Poland may be in the works. The occasion is the 600th anniversary of the Black Madonna, the most revered shrine in Poland. The anniversary takes place this summer, my friends, less than six months from now. In addition to the existing crises, new crises are also being stirred up with more to come. These will be developing in both East and West. Right now a major new crisis is building up between two NATO members, Greece and Turkey. The new Government of Greece wants to extricate itself from the war maneuverings of the Bolshevik-controlled United States and NATO. Washington is responding with military blackmail. Turkey's harsh military dictatorship has designs on sea and land controlled by Greece and the United States is egging them on. Bulgaria and Romania, Soviet bloc neighbors of Greece and Turkey, are also targeted for turmoil soon. American Bolshevik agents are hard at work there to create a serious dispute between these two Warsaw Pact members. If they succeed, it will be just one more Poland-style headache for Russia's new anti-Bolshevik rulers. The American Bolsheviks here are pressing ahead fast in their efforts to bring on Nuclear War One. In this they are joined by their Zionist partners in Israel. In AUDIO LETTER No. 67 I describe the Joint Military Junta which today controls the actions of both the United States and Israel. The Reagan-Bagan Axis is moving the world steadily closer to nuclear war. Neither government is making the slightest effort to act in the true best interests of its own citizens. This situation is a secret in both countries. It's as much a mystery to most Israelis as it is to most Americans. In both countries there is growing alarm over the lockstep toward war. Here in America this is taking the form of mounting demands for a nuclear weapons freeze. In Israel the Begin Government is facing repeated no-confidence votes over its repressive policies toward Palestinians, but both governments are bent on war and they expect to bring it about before they can be stopped. The present Begin Government repression in the occupied Arab territories have been calculated with care. They are intended specifically to shatter the shaky Middle East peace. For one thing, Israeli repression of Palestinians within their jurisdiction is intended to stir up PLO activity in southern Lebanon. In addition, Israel's suspension of political rights for Arabs in the occupied territories is a violation of the Camp David Accords. Instead of negotiating increased autonomy for the Arabs, the Begin Government is taking away what little autonomy they already had. These things are intended to produce a chain reaction of events, that is, PLO raids on Israel, an Israeli invasion of Lebanon, war between Israel and Syria, creating a proxy battle between America and Russia, disintegrating peace ties between Israel and Egypt, an incident in the Sinai involving America's buffer troops there, ensnarement of Saudi Arabia in the collapsing peace on and on, wider and wider, seemingly out of control. All these artificial crises are leading fast toward Nuclear War One, and when it comes the Bolsheviks here plan to be ready. For the first time the Space Shuttle has been successful in its secret military mission. Even more importantly, their most ambitious crash weapons project is now bearing fruit. My friends, the United States has developed a new super-weapon, 
as revolutionary as the atom bomb was four decades ago. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1. The New Phantom Warplanes of the United States Topic No. 2. Project Z the three-phase strategy for Nuclear War One, and Topic No. 3, the first military success of the Space Shuttle. Topic No. 1. On December 6, 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt authorized the spending of funds to begin a super-secret weapons project. Its goal? To develop a giant bomb so powerful that it would make all lesser weapons obsolete overnight. It was the beginning of what was later called the Manhattan Project. The project was intended to develop a bomb to fight a war that did not yet exist, but the very next day, December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor took care of that. Just one day after the A-Bomb Project began, America was at war right on schedule. The Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb was the largest, most complex, and most costly military project in history up to that time, and yet it was conducted in total secrecy. The money spent on the atom bomb project dwarfed all other weapons programs, yet it was spent without the knowledge of Congress. Entire new laboratories were built, thousands of people were involved, and yet fewer than 100 persons knew what the Manhattan Project was all about. The Manhattan Project was to develop a super weapon, something straight from the pages of science fiction. If most people had been asked, they would have said that an atomic bomb was impossible, but in matters like this public opinion counts for nothing at all. A small handful of scientists knew that it could be done. They did the seemingly impossible, and they did it in well under four years. The A-Bomb Project went from a standing start in December 1941 to the attack on Hiroshima in August 1945. My friends, I can now report for the first time that a new program like the Manhattan Project has been underway here in the United States. Like the atomic bomb 40 years ago, the new weapon sounds like something straight from the pages of science fiction. Like the Manhattan Project, the new project has been carried out in utmost secrecy. Vast amounts of money have been spent on it without the slightest hint to the public or Congress, and just as happened with the atomic bomb, the new weapon is intended to make its debut in war itself and not before. I first began reporting that crash weapons projects were being started here in the United States four years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. These projects were started in response to Russia's surprise military takeover of space in late 1977. From time to time since then, I have reported on the progress of a number of these secret programs to prepare for war. In Operation Desktop, ICBMs have been planted in supposedly invulnerable locations on the ocean floor. In the secret Minuteman TX mobile missile program, a large number of small ICBMs are now shuttling around the United States in special railroad cars. Meanwhile, the phony MX missile controversy has been used as a cover for this secret project. Then there is the High Power Laser Program, which has led to a number of laser weapons. And of course, there is the Space Shuttle Program a desperate attempt to regain a military toehold in space. While we are shown entertaining space movies on TV by NASA, we are never shown what is really happening on each flight. Never! I have given many details about these secret weapons programs in past AUDIO LETTER reports. Now I have obtained urgent information about a crash military program which is shrouded in the deepest secrecy of all. It is an Air Force project involving technology which is as revolutionary today as the atomic bomb was 40 years ago. This secret superweapon project is the basis for an entire new nuclear war strategy 
of the American Bolshevik war planners. It is a renegade program totally unknown both to the public and to Congress. Even within the military, this weapons program is known only within very limited circles. You, my friends, will understand the reasons for this extreme secrecy when you hear how it is to be used in the coming war. I will reveal this Master War Strategy, codenamed Project Z, in Topic No. 2. Ever since the summer of 1980, there have been vague reports in the news about what is called the Stealth Bomber Program. We're told that ways are being developed to make a bomber undetectable by radar. We're also led to believe that a stealth plane will not be operational until 1991. The fact is, my friends, that these are only cover stories to hide a far more radical weapons program and it will be operational not in far-off 1991, but this year, 1982. The stealth program is structured very much like the Minuteman TX program which I made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 55. In the case of the Minuteman TX, public attention was focused on the alleged MX missile, and in fact work is underway to develop a missile called MX but all of that was set up primarily as a cover for the secret Minuteman TX program. It provided a way to camouflage research, development, and manufacturing of the TX. Now that the TX mobile missile system is virtually deployed on our railroads, the MX is gradually fading from the scene. The furious debate over all those ridiculous MX racetracks out west is gone having served its purpose of distraction, and now there is talk of cutting out funding for the MX in the 1983 budget. Can you imagine? It's all very much the same with the Stealth Program. Various companies and laboratories are experimenting with ways to foil radar. These experiments include special aerodynamic shapes, coatings, electronic countermeasures, and so on, but all this is important mainly as a cover and a funding channel for the really secret work. One product of the covert stealth projects was called a submersible aircraft, or subcraft for short. I first described subcraft in AUDIO LETTER No. 37, August 1978, when they were beginning flight tests. In January 1980 there was an attempt to actually use them against Russia with disastrous results. The first public leaks about the stealth program took place six months later in the summer of 1980. Up to that time nothing better than the unsuccessful subcraft had been produced, but now the situation has changed. The biggest gamble of all in the stealth program has involved a scientific leap forward as dramatic as the atomic bomb, and it is succeeding. What I am about to reveal may sound impossible to some people. If so, just stop and think about the things that would have seemed impossible 40 years ago which we take for granted today. Jet airplanes, worldwide television, men on the moon, local weather forecasts with satellite pictures of planet Earth, lasers, photocopy machines, frozen food, and computers. Think what a giant leap in technology was taken in the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb 40 years ago. For example, there were no computers in those days. Even the most advanced scientific calculations had to be done by hand with some help from slide rules, adding machines, and mathematical tables. By contrast, today you can go to a store and buy a hand calculator that will outperform anything that was available to the A-Bomb Project. And a hand calculator like that is a mere toy compared with the powerful high-speed computers that are common today. In other areas, too, the technology of the 1980s is a far cry from that of the 1940s. So just ask yourself, if we could develop the atom bomb using pencils and slide rules, what might we develop today using computers? And if it took less than four years with the primitive tools of the 1940s, why should a crash program today take any longer? The most secret branch of the stealth program, my friends, is developing aircraft that are invisible 
to more than just radar. They are invisible even to the eye. These invisible Phantom warplanes carry special electromagnetic gear. The equipment includes superconducting magnets, which are maintained at temperatures close to absolute zero. This cryogenic equipment creates an enormously powerful electromagnetic field around the aircraft. The field is designed according to the principles of Einstein's Unified Field Theory. Einstein never completely finished his Unified Field Theory, but it has been studied by numerical techniques using computers. By this brute force method, enough has been learned to apply Unified Field Theory to the new Phantom Warplanes. When the invisibility field is turned on, a Phantom Warplane is encased in a sort of electromagnetic bubble. Light that strikes the field from any direction divides, passes around the plane, comes together again on the other side and goes on. The effect is like a boulder in a stream. Water flowing towards the boulder divides, goes around it, and then comes together again on the other side. To understand why this makes the plane invisible, stop and think how you see objects. Suppose you look across the room at a chair. Light bounces off the chair in a certain pattern, travels through the air, and strikes your eyes. Your eyes then recognize the light pattern as a chair. Now suppose someone walks between you and the chair. Light bouncing off the chair is stopped by the person who is in the way, so you no longer see the chair. Instead you see the person by reflected light. Now my friends, consider a new situation. Suppose that the person were encased in a special bubble like that of a Phantom Warplane. He steps between you and the chair. The light waves from the chair strike the bubble, flow around him, come together again, and continue to your eyes. So you still see the chair, but because of the bubble no light is reflected back from that person, so you cannot see him. In other words, he is invisible. He is there, all right, between you and the chair, but because of the way the light behaves around his protective shield, you cannot see him. This is basically how the invisibility shield works on a Phantom Warplane. The only difference is that the field is not as sharply defined as a bubble. It is strong close to the plane and grows weaker with distance. From a distance the plane is totally invisible when it is airborne. A Phantom Warplane is invisible to the eye and also to radar. Radar is like light except for wavelength and behaves the same way when it hits the invisibility shield. It just divides, flows past the plane, converges on the other side, and continues onward. It does not bounce back, so there is no radar return. Invisibility is the most striking feature of a Phantom Warplane, but it is not the most important. The greatest value of the invisibility field is its protection against beam weapons. A Phantom Warplane is totally immune to lasers because a laser beam is just intense light. The invisibility field also gives protection against Russia's charged particle beam. Charged particles are far easier to deflect than light, so the charged particle beam is no match for the light deflecting shield. That leaves only neutral beam weapons. Russia's neutron beam would penetrate the invisibility shield, but ways have been found to shield against neutron radiation well enough to make neutron beams ineffective in stopping a Phantom Warplane. That's especially true because extremely effective shielding is part of the basic design of a Phantom Warplane. Without it, the gigantic electromagnetic field which produces invisibility would derange electronic instruments as well as the crew if it is manned. So the net result is this, my friends. The new Phantom Warplane of the United States is not detectable by conventional means and it is believed to be invulnerable to all of Russia's beam weapons. Those beam weapons have been the keys to Russia's military superiority since late 1977, so the Phantom Warplane is the ideal weapon to attack Russia. The Phantom Warplane has just one major drawback. 
In a way, its greatest strength is also its greatest weakness. When the invisibility field is turned on, incoming light waves do not strike the plane. Instead, the light flows around the plane, as I have explained. That is what makes the plane invisible to observers at a distance, but at the same time the field prevents light waves from the outside world from reaching the cockpit of the plane. In other words, the pilot cannot see anything outside the invisibility field. He is required to fly blind. There is only one technique known in the West by which a Phantom Warplane can be navigated. It's called inertial guidance, a technique first invented for ICBMs a quarter century ago. In inertial guidance, a computerized system keeps track of all the forces and maneuvers experienced by the vehicle. By adding these up over time, the system calculates where it is without reference to the outside world. For a Phantom Warplane, the inertial guidance problem is very difficult. The guidance system must operate for as long as several hours while the plane flies to its target. That gives lots of time for errors to build up which would send the plane off course, but the problem has been solved. New inertial guidance technology has been developed using lasers in place of the old mechanical gyros used on ICBMs. And so the super-secret Phantom Warplane project has succeeded in producing a new super-weapon. It's as revolutionary today as the atomic bomb was nearly a half century ago. Prototypes are now flying, and a rush production program is already underway. The Secret War planners here expect to have an operational fleet ready by this summer of 1982. This is now the pacing item in the short New War timetable which I made public last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 72. The secret new fleet of Phantom Warplanes are the key to a complete new Pentagon war plan, which I will reveal in Topic No. 2. This is why fresh reconnaissance data on Russian targets is so critical to the war planning here. When Phantom Warplanes take off to attack Russia, they will have to know ahead of time exactly where the target is. Flying blind on inertial guidance, they cannot look around and change course to find a target. For a year now the Space Shuttle has been making a desperate attempt to obtain the needed target information from space. It would be the first new data since Russia destroyed our spy satellites four years ago. The first two Shuttle flights were not successful in their secret military mission, but as I revealed last month, the American Bolshevik war planners in the Pentagon have scored an intelligence coup against Russia, and now Space Shuttle 3 has been successful. The war planners here are now obtaining the most crucial target data needed for a Phantom warplane attack against Russia. As a result, a whole new war plan is now being prepared for the coming nuclear war. America's war strategists are now eager for war because they now believe they can achieve victory over Russia. But my friends, their concept of victory does not include you and me. The secret war strategists here are preparing to sacrifice America and most of her people on the altar of world domination. Topic No. 2 the radically new Phantom Warplane is causing an equally radical revision of the Master War Strategy of the United States. Elements of several past strategies are now being blended together to create a new Grand Plan. It is this new Grand Master Strategy which America's war planners are counting on to bring them victory in Nuclear War I, and they plan to use the War Plan very soon by the autumn of this year, 1982. Strategic Nuclear War Planning here in Washington is now being carried out under the code name Project Z. The letter Z was chosen because it is the final letter in the alphabet. The war planners here are confident that this is the last war plan they will need against Russia. War planning under Project Z is so secret that it's not being done at the Pentagon itself. Instead, an elite group of war strategists have been assembled at a special war room in downtown Washington. 
The war room is hidden away in a building which would never be suspected for the purpose. It's practically within the shadow of the White House. The elite war planners for Nuclear War One constitute a very small group. Their job is to think in terms of the big picture. They have at their fingertips computer terminals with which they can access any information they need from other government computers. This includes not only Pentagon data banks but also the computer files of other government agencies. As I say these words, the Project Z war planners have already arrived at the broad outlines for their master war plan. Countless details and refinements still lie ahead, but the basic strategy is already decided. That strategy is what I am about to reveal to you. The Project Z strategy for Nuclear War One is a three-phase plan. That is, the war planners intend for the war to proceed in three distinct phases. These phases are known as Phase 1, Initiation, Phase 2, Attrition, and Phase 3, Domination. In past reports I've given many details about the process which is to lead up to the coming war. That process is based on ever-increasing world crises like those that led up to World War I. We are now seeing that process in full swing all around us. Within six months from now these deliberate crises are supposed to provide the spark to set off Nuclear War One. The Project Z war planners are concerned with the military acts from that initial spark onward. Phase One in their plan, the initiation phase, will begin with an American surprise attack against Russia. The surprise attack will use the new Phantom warplanes. They will be the key to the outcome of the rest of the war. Some three and one-half years ago in the summer of 1978, I reported that America was shifting to a first-strike nuclear strategy against Russia. In AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I described the prime objective of any such American first strike. It will be to knock out the Earth bases for Russia's space triad of strategic weapons. If that can be done, Russia's overwhelming military power in space will soon wither and die. That will leave the United States and Russia on more equal terms for the rest of the war. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 37, the plan was to use a combination of subcraft and unmanned aircraft called RPVs for the initial attack. That plan was actually attempted over two years ago as I reported in AUDIO LETTERS No. 53 and 54. It ended in total failure because subcraft and RPVs were no match for Russia's Cosmospheres with their beam weapons. But now the new Phantom warplanes are almost ready, and the plan is being revived in updated form. Phantom warplanes are intended to be based in at least three countries on Russia's doorstep. These basing areas are northern Norway, eastern Turkey, and most critical of all, Sinkan Province in northwestern China. Already high-power lasers are being moved into those areas. They are equipped with a new aiming device called CEIR SEER, which I described last month. These lasers have the proven ability to shoot down Cosmospheres. They will be used to protect the Phantom Warplanes from destruction on the ground by Cosmospheres. The Phantom Warplanes which will be used are unmanned. They are equipped with robot pilots which can be programmed to fly each plane to a pre-assigned target. Each will be programmed for a one-way trip. The invisible robot piloted aircraft will fly through Russian airspace invulnerable to any beam weapon attacks. Anti-aircraft missiles fired at them will be unable to hone in on them, and so the Project Z planners believe that the robot Phantom planes will reach their targets. Those targets are Russia's four Cosmodromes for rockets plus several Cosmosphere installations in central Siberia. The invisible robot planes will crash like kamikazes into their targets. Seemingly out of a clear blue sky, all of Russia's space bases will suddenly vanish in thermonuclear fireballs. 
In addition to Russia's space bases, the Phantom Warplane assault will also be directed at one other category of prime targets. Those are the bases for Russia's flying anti-missile system, which I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 54. The system consists of a fleet of Tu-144 supersonic transports equipped with particle beam weapons. They are supposed to provide Russia's final line of defense against incoming missile warheads. American Phantom warplanes will be programmed to destroy the Tu-144 bases. Phase 1 of the Project Z war plan continues on a very tight timetable. If the invisible warplane attack succeeds, a furious counterattack by Russia is guaranteed. Project Z calls for the United States to beat Russia to the punch. In AUDIO LETTER No. 66 last summer, 1981, I revealed the plan by which America's entire nuclear arsenal is to be fired at Russia. It will be done by creating a false indication that America is under nuclear attack. The method which will be employed is known as Electromagnetic Pulse or EMP. EMP is a phenomenon associated with nuclear blasts at the fringes of space. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 66, our strategic forces are being programmed to consider an EMP episode to be positive proof of a Russian attack. Under those circumstances, they are instructed to counterattack against Russia without waiting for any further orders. In the Project Z timetable, the Phantom Warplane explosions in Russia will be followed moments later by nuclear detonations over North America. These will be the warheads of American high-speed missiles called ACMs. They will be launched into the sky from various locations around the United States to create a violent EMP episode. Our strategic nuclear forces obeying orders will launch what they will believe to be retaliation against Russia. As the American ACMs are launched into the sky over our heads, still another event is to be underway. Last month I reported that a Russian Cosmosphere had been shot down for the first time in January over New Jersey. In the same way, high-power lasers located in many places around the United States will be shooting down as many Cosmospheres as possible. By the time our ICBMs are launched a few minutes later, it's expected that many of the threatening Cosmospheres overhead will have been destroyed. They will be unable to blast all of our missiles as they are launched, and many will survive to be on their way to Russia. Thanks to the initial Phantom warplane attack, Russia's flying ABM system will also be out of action. Stripped of all her defenses against missile attack, the Soviet Union will soon be aflame with a sea of nuclear firestorms. In the Project Z war plan, the arrival of American ICBMs on Russian targets marks the end of Phase 1 of the war, the Initiation Phase. Next comes Phase 2, the Attrition Phase. During Phase 2, the war planners here envision extreme damage to both the United States and Russia with the war gradually running down. First there will be a rain of Russian missile warheads on the United States. There will also be missile attacks on certain other targets around the world where American military forces are located but the real destruction will be right here in the United States itself. The Project Z war planners do not expect America as we know it to survive a nuclear exchange. Unlike Russia, the United States has no civil defense worthy of the name, let alone hardened blast shelters, and because of the need for total surprise in the attack against Russia's space bases, the ensuing nuclear exchanges will come without warning. Vacationers will be on beaches. Businessmen will be making deals. Housewives will be in supermarkets. Children will be at play. Suddenly air raid sirens may start to blare, as they did on a summer day in Hiroshima 36 years ago, but it will be too late. The America we know and love will die in a thousand Hiroshimas. The war schemers have planned for all that. While you and I and our children vanish from the face of the earth, they intend to be riding out the attack they have caused in government war bunkers. 
Gradually over a period of many months they expect the conflict between Russia and the United States to sputter out. Both sides will be exhausted and ruined. Both will lose the capacity to carry the war any further. In Russia the wounds will be grievous, up to 50 million dead and millions more injured, but in the United States the wounds will be mortal. The Project Z war planners have figured it out on their computers. If we are lucky, from 40 to 50 million Americans may survive at the end of Nuclear War One. All the rest will have been killed outright in nuclear attacks or will have died of injuries and disease. Nuclear War One will leave medical care virtually non-existent in what is left of America. The American Bolsheviks here intend to ride out the war after setting it off. They will wait until the stalemate point is reached, with both sides unable to fight any longer. That will mark the end of Phase Two, the attrition phase. Finally, the Project Z war plan will move into the third and final phase. That phase is world domination by the Satanic Bolsheviks who now control the United States military. In this final phase the Bolsheviks here in America will be taking advantage of secret preparations which began long ago. In AUDIO LETTER No. 28 I described the two-pronged strategy for world domination which the four Rockefeller brothers launched in 1961. One side of this twin strategy required the United States to give the impression that it was growing steadily weaker, disarming unilaterally, but that was only for public consumption. The secret side of the strategy involved an actual build-up of armaments in secret. When the Bolsheviks here seized power from the Rockefellers, they continued the stockpiling of secret reserves or armaments worldwide. When Nuclear War I sputters out into exhausted stalemate, they plan to bring these secret reserves of military power into the open. Even if the entire populations of the United States and Russia are gone, that will still leave 95% of the world's population alive. With the world's only surviving major military force, they believe world domination will be theirs at last. Topic No. 3 Yesterday morning, March 30, Space Shuttle Flight No. 3 officially ended one day behind schedule. For the first time we got to see a shuttle landing at the White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico. As I detailed last year in AUDIO LETTER No. 64, White Sands is the true nerve center of the Space Shuttle program. This third shuttle flight also chalked up another first, and this one was not visible on television. For the first time, my friends, a Space Shuttle has succeeded in its secret military mission. By doing so, the Shuttle has removed one more barrier to nuclear war. The accelerated war planning now underway here in Washington will be able to proceed even faster thanks to the Space Shuttle. The third Shuttle mission took place nearly one year after the first flight of April 1981. A comparison between the first and third flights is a study in ironies. Last April publicity about the first flight was designed to give the impression that it was unnaturally perfect. Meanwhile the secret military mission, which we did not see, was a disaster. This time on Flight No. 3 it was the other way around. From start to finish the publicity emanating from NASA gave the impression that the shuttle was plagued with problems. NASA wanted to be able to explain it away if disaster should strike again, but as it turned out the military mission in space, hidden from our eyes, was a success. In AUDIO LETTER No. 72 last month I described what that mission was. Space Shuttle No. 3 was supposed to orbit a special new spy satellite which I described last year in AUDIO LETTER No. 62. It is hardened against attack from Russia's space weapons and armed with a robot-controlled laser that can shoot back. In addition, the Shuttle itself was armed with lasers this time as I detailed last month. The public image of a troubled plague Shuttle flight actually got underway several days before launch thanks to the weather. Drenching rainstorms turned Edwards Air Force Base in California, used for the first two Shuttle landings, into a soggy mess. The tight military schedule of the Shuttle program required that the flight take off on schedule anyway. So for public consumption 
a 23-car railroad train loaded with equipment was sent from California to New Mexico. Ostensibly, NASA was setting up a spur-of-the-moment landing site at the White Sands Missile Range. This was done so that the central role of White Sands in the Shuttle program would not be suspected by the public. Space Shuttle No. 3 lifted off from Cape Canaveral only an hour behind schedule on Monday morning, March 22. Beginning at the moment of liftoff, NASA started laying the bases for a cover-up story should the military mission fail. First we heard the pre-recorded voice of Shuttle Commander Jack Lausma saying unexplained white flakes were flying past the windshield. Later, after the Shuttle was out of sight, we were told that one of the power packs called an APU was malfunctioning. These initial hints of possible trouble had been pre-recorded for broadcast during the launch for a reason. There was fear that the Shuttle might be destroyed by Russian space weapons before reaching orbit. Had that happened, the Shuttle managers wanted to be able to initiate a cover-up which would not reveal the military situation. But as it turned out, the preparations which I detailed last month were successful. Shuttle No. 3 did reach orbit successfully, and a key to success was a radical new maneuver added to the flight plan. When Space Shuttle 3 took off last week, it headed into the northeast. Long-distance cameras followed it until the two solid rockets separated and fell away. Then, as the Shuttle disappeared from sight, it started its long sweeping turn into the north. It was heading toward a near-polar orbit so that it would pass over Russia. This much of the flight plan was the same as in the past, but this time a critical new feature was added. Less than 30 seconds after the Shuttle disappeared from TV cameras, the cargo bay doors were blasted off. This opened up a field of fire for the defensive laser at the front of the cargo bay which I discussed in AUDIO LETTER No. 72. Then the Shuttle and its giant external tank started rotating slowly in a space-age version of a barrel roll. In World War II, fighter pilots made use of the barrel roll to avoid bullets from enemy airplanes. Likewise, the Space Shuttle this month used a barrel roll to protect itself against possible attack from Russian Cosmospheres. By rotating like a corkscrew, the Shuttle made it impossible for a Cosmosphere to approach safely from any direction. The barrel roll maneuver was a very risky one for the Shuttle. The Shuttle and tank were never designed with such aerobatics in mind, but calculations showed that it should survive a slow roll, and it did. One of the biggest questions about the barrel roll stunt was what it would do to the astronauts, Lausma and Fullerton. They were required to withstand these dizzying gyrations for about six minutes. At the same time, the Shuttle was still accelerating with up to three times the force of gravity, and because of the peculiar design of the Shuttle and fuel tank, the gyrations were sickening indeed. Military space doctors knew that at best Lausma and Fullerton would be very sick for some time after reaching orbit. Their wild, crushing, spinning ride would end abruptly in weightlessness. That is a combination guaranteed to derange the equilibrium of even the toughest astronaut. Nothing remotely like it had ever been done in space before. Doctors were worried that even if Lausman and Fullerton survived the mission and returned to Earth, there could be permanent damage to their equilibrium. When Lausma and Fullerton reached orbit, they did indeed become violently ill. That's why we heard those reports about nausea striking both men. NASA wanted to pave the way for a plausible public explanation if they should not appear well when they returned to Earth. At the same time, the Shuttle planners knew perfectly well why they were sick. That is why NASA spokesmen acted so unconcerned when discussing the space sickness with reporters. When they called it motion sickness, quote unquote, they were making an understatement. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 72 last month, I reported that the plan was for Lausma and Fullerton to begin work immediately upon reaching orbit. Their extensively modified crew compartment was to be depressurized already with the two men depending upon their space suits. This plan had to be modified slightly when the barrel roll was added to the flight plan. When the Shuttle reached orbit, the astronauts were in space suits, 
but the cabin was still pressurized. They were allowed several minutes to get from the flight deck to the Gemini-type escape capsule stored below. Once inside the escape capsule, they depressurized the cabin. Then the nose laser system deployed automatically to protect the shuttle against any attacks by Russian space weapons. This allowed Lausman and Fullerton to recover from space sickness inside the capsule. For the next 24 hours or so, getting well was their main task. It was a period of vulnerability, of depending on the untried automatic laser system for protection. The shuttle planners wanted to have an excuse ready later should the shuttle be attacked and destroyed. So the day after the launch we were shown TV pictures of missing tiles on the nose of the shuttle. According to those pictures, my friends, at least a dozen tiles in the black area were lost. If that had really happened, it would have been cause for great alarm. Later on NASA spokesman downplayed it, saying the tiles were non-critical, but there is no such thing as a non-critical black tile. The black tiles supposedly lost are to withstand temperatures above 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Under the tile there is nothing but a piece of felt called a strain isolation pad. It would not last five seconds in those temperatures, and under the felt is the metal skin of the shuttle. It is made of aluminum, which loses its strength above 350 degrees. If exposed to 1500 degree heat by a few missing black tiles, the shuttle could not possibly avoid severe damage. The NASA space movies we saw on TV were a pre-recorded hoax to provide an excuse if something went wrong, but it did not. The astronauts recovered, went to work, and deployed the new military satellite. Meanwhile NASA spokesman waved aside the alleged tile problem as minor. It had served its purpose and was no longer needed. Throughout the rest of the week we heard about one problem after another. Supposedly the cargo bay doors would not close. The toilet would not work. Three out of four communication channels went out. One of the three crucial data display screens in the cockpit failed. None of these stories were true. All were devised to provide a cover story for possible problems with a secret mission, but in the end none of them were needed, and so NASA spokesmen just waved them aside as unimportant. The secret military mission was a success, so the pretended mission which was cooked up for TV was declared a success too. Late Friday night, March 26, Lausma and Fullerton finished deploying the new Super Spy satellite. It had taken longer than planned, but it was done. As I explained last month, they left their shuttle in orbit. They re-entered their Gemini-type escape capsule, fired its retro rockets, and dropped out of orbit to an Indian Ocean splashdown. From there they were flown non-stop to the White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico. The shuttle managers took advantage of a sandstorm at White Sands to delay the public landing for one extra day while the astronauts recuperated. Then yesterday morning they boarded one of the two remaining secret shuttles at White Sands. The shuttle took off from the north end of the immense White Sands Range using small solid rockets. Moments before 11 a.m. it made its appearance on TV. It swooped in from the north, dropped down over the mountains, and touched down in a cloud of white dust. Finally, after a respectable wait, out stepped Lousman and Fullerton, rested and refreshed. My friends, like every other American, I find myself wanting to cheer at the success of Space Shuttle Flight No. 3. It was achieved against incredible odds in the face of Russia's overwhelming power in space. Determination, ingenuity, and sheer boldness carried the day. That is how I am tempted to feel. But then I have to recall the ultimate purpose of all this. The military shuttle managers are not doing these things to prevent war, but to prepare to fight one. The success of Space Shuttle 3, my friends, has brought us a giant step closer to thermonuclear war. Now it's time for my last minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I've reported on major developments now taking place in our headlong rush into nuclear war. The United States has developed a new secret super weapon, the invisible Phantom Warplane. Its invulnerability to beam weapons makes it the centerpiece of a whole new war strategy against Russia. 
This strategy, codenamed Project Z, involves an American surprise attack on Russia followed by all-out war. Until now the main weakness of the war plan has been the lack of fresh reconnaissance data on Russia, but now that problem is rapidly being solved. Last month I reported a major intelligence coup against Russia by the war planners here, and now the success of Space Shuttle 3 is adding to the momentum for nuclear war. My friends, for many years now our Lord Jesus Christ has held back the Holocaust that threatens to engulf us. Time after time we have come to the very brink only to be pulled back and spared once again. Our Lord is not willing that any should perish, and He has shown us mercy over and over. But what have we as a nation done in response to that mercy? Have we mended our ways, returned to Him, and revived the values that made America great? The answer, my friends, is found in the words of the Prophet Jeremiah, Chapter 5. We have spoken falsely of the Lord, and have said He will do nothing. No evil will come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. Behold, I am bringing upon you a nation from afar, says the Lord. It is an enduring nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know. My friends, our Satanic Bolshevik leaders here intend to destroy the ancient enduring nation of Russia whose language we do not know. But our Lord Jesus Christ sees all, and He alone will repay. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.